the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is the hired hand and not the shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as my Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not in this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This instruction I received from my Father. My sisters and brothers, this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, from the Gospel of John, 
and, and I, this is an exciting time of the year for me because I, I love the Gospel of John, and it is this point in the liturgical cycle where we engage more fully with the Gospel of John because mostly our liturgical cycle follows the three synoptic Gospels. Uh, cycle A is Matthew, Mark is Cycle B, and Luke is Cycle C, which we're in right now. But during Easter, we set aside the synoptic Gospels for the most part, and we now engage fully with the Gospel of John. And we have these very beautiful readings. And the one we have today, this discourse where Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd, uh, is, is certainly, again, one of the most beautiful discourses that we have in all of Scripture. Let me, lay, let me lay a little background for you on this particular passage. It's fascinating. The story really starts back in Galilee. This is about six months before the events of Holy Week. Jesus is still in Galilee with his disciples. And he has already told them, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And of course we know their reaction has been, no, that's, we don't want, we, that's not what's going to happen, Lord. So we know all that. We've, we've heard that. So Jesus is, is still in Galilee, and we have this very strange account, and I, I think it's actually missing from our lectionary cycle, certainly for Sundays, I think it's actually kind of been edited out, because we don't get, you know, the full readings um, every, you know, every Sunday we get a, a, a different piece. The brothers of Jesus, the brothers, not his disciples, the brothers of Jesus approach Jesus and they say, hey, so they're, they're kind of, they're a little bit cynical. And they say, hey, you're trying to get the word out about yourself. Why don't you go up to the feast? It's the Feast of Tabernacles. Why don't you go up there and you can, you can spread your message? And that's a brief, that's a, that's a loose interpretation. But, but basically, the brothers are, 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 are goading him a little bit. And even the gospel writer says, for at this point, his brothers did not believe in him. And so, again, another loose interpretation. Jesus says, uh, you guys go on ahead. I'm just going to hang out. <coughs> and so he stays in Jerusalem. Uh, he stays in Galilee. But then John tells us something else. He says, Jesus had determined that he would go up to the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, secretly. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, for those who, who aren't familiar with that, is one of the three great festivals of the Jewish liturgical year. It's the time when when everyone would go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and they would set up tents, or booths, or tabernacles. Tabernacle is just another way of saying tent in, 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 in the Greek. And so they would travel there, and over a seven day period, they would, they would essentially reenact the wandering of the Jewish people in the desert during the 40 years. And so, again, they would live in tents, and that's how they would celebrate, remember, and reenact this, this special feast. So Jesus, he goes up to the feast, but in secret. And he shows up about halfway through the feast, and he begins to teach within the temple precincts. Now this is one of the things, um, John, this is an interesting point, there's an ancient tradition that John was the last gospel to be written. And that it was John's followers who urged him to write his gospel to essentially fill in spaces where the synoptic gospels, where Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had not given us all the details. And so, in fact, as you read through the gospel of John, you'll find it's, it's got a very different format. And it absolutely fills in so many of these spaces that, which we don't have in the synoptics. And this is one of those places. We can date these events to the very day based on John's chronology. We know that this occurs. The, the feast that year would have been uh, in October. The middle of the feast would have fallen somewhere around October the 14th or 15th. And that was the year 29. So we know exactly when this occurred. Jesus goes up to the feast and he starts teaching in the temple. And of course this begins to to create, again, these questions among the religious leaders. They begin to, to challenge him and ask him questions. And so we have this period where Jesus is there in the temple and we start to have these exchanges between the religious authorities and Jesus. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stands up and he says, If anyone is thirsty, 
Let him come to me and drink of the living water, and out of them will flow living streams. Well, in the feast, one of the important liturgical events of that feast was the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam, which was near the temple, and they would get water, and they would bring back large amounts of water, and that water would be poured into a large vessel next to the altar. And so there was this symbolism. Water was an important symbol for the Feast of Tabernacles. And so here you have Jesus saying, yeah, I can imagine him standing there in the temple saying, yeah, here's the water, but here's the reality. I am the living water. That's only a shadow. I am the reality. The feast continues, the disputes continue, and actually this is, at this point, they're on the final day of the feast, which is probably October 18th. Jesus is, continues to have these discussions with the religious leaders, and then he's, he stands up again and he says, I am the light of the world. And if anyone follows me, they will not walk in darkness. Now, another, another of the liturgical events at the feast was the lighting of these huge candelabra that would light the entire temple. And so I can just again imagine Jesus standing there with these lights, you know, with these lights shining their light out. And what does Jesus do? He says, I am the light of the world. You see these? No, I'm the reality. These are shadows. Again, Jesus is saying things which to the, 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 the religious leaders would have been extremely provoc provocative. He was making messianic claims. And so again, this initiates more engagement with the religious leaders to the point where they begin to challenge him and they say, look, who are you? We have Abraham as, as, and the fathers. Who, who are you? And he says, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And at that point, Jesus is making allusion to the, to the appearance of, the, of Moses in the burning bush where when Moses asks God, who are you and what is... The voice that comes out of the burning bush says, go and tell, go and tell them, I am that I am, or I am who I am. And so here you have, again, Jesus making this very powerful allusion to being somehow God's representative who is now embodying, who is tabernacling the reality that all these things that are surrounding him in the temple are simply shadows of. It's incredibly powerful. The Jewish leaders, again, aren't happy. And at this point, they're looking to, to do some serious harm to Jesus. So he slips out of the precincts of the temple. And as he does, he leaves there. And he comes upon a man who is born blind. Again, this is all what, you know, I would call this Jesus' big day. Because there's a lot of stuff going on. It's, it's all happening in one single day. Jesus comes out of the temple and he sees this man who is born blind. And he takes spittle. He takes dirt, mixes it together, and he puts it on the man's eyes. And what does he tell him? He says, go to the pool of Siloam, where they had just take, gotten all this water for their temple liturgy. Wash your eyes. And he does. He goes, he washes his eyes, and of course we know the story. He is, he is instantly given his sight, and he is telling everybody about it. And if you want to read probably one of the most entertaining and humorous stories in all of the Gospels when you get home, Read the story of the man born blind. Because he does not back down from the Jewish authorities at all. He gives them everything they can handle, and it's actually quite humorous. But in their anger, they literally, and the, and the, Jew, the Greek word is very strong, it's ekphalo, which means they literally pick him up by the seat of his pants, and they throw him out of the temple, or out of their, out of their presence. And here we have something that I think is unprecedented in the gospel, something very unique happens. Jesus hears that this man has been thrown out. He's been, he's been banned from his, his own Jewish life by the temple authorities. Jesus seeks him out. Jesus goes and finds this man. He goes, finds him, and he looks him down in the eye, and the man can see Jesus, and he says, do you want to believe in the Son of Man? And he says, Lord, show me who it is, and I will believe. And Jesus says, it is I who you see, 
who stands before you, and the man says, Lord, I believe. We have this beautiful story of, of the good shepherd. Go and finding that lost sheep and touching that man's life. It's a beautiful story. It is at this point that Jesus then says to all those surround, all those who are standing around, they watch this event happen. They watch Jesus deal with, have this interaction with this man, and now Jesus turns and he says, I am the good shepherd. Those who had been listening to it would have heard many resonances from the Old Testament. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I am the one who is faithful. I am the one who takes care of my sheep. My sheep know my voice and I know theirs. Jesus is making these beautiful allusions to the Old Testament. To Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. To, the, to Ezekiel chapter 34, which was a very powerful chapter in the book of Ezekiel, where, where the prophet compares, he says, God is the shepherd of Israel, and that the religious leaders are false shepherds. They are leading the people astray. And so when Jesus stands there and he says, Look, I'm the good shepherd, the religious leaders that are before you, they are thieves and robbers. Jesus is making a very powerful comparison. He's saying, I'm the good shepherd. The religious leaders that you've been following are not faithful shepherds. They are not leading you in the right way. And by saying thieves and robbers, he was actually putting them in essentially in the lowest class of society. It was more than just a statement. It was, it was truly putting them in the lowest caste of society. It was, a, again, a very, very provocative and powerful statement by Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. There's a, a verse that we used to sing when, many years ago uh, that when I was at, at Calvary Chapel. And we would sing this verse. It's from Isaiah chapter 40. He shall lead his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those who are with young. It's a beautiful image. And that is who our Good Shepherd is. We have truly, we worship the Good Shepherd. About six years ago, we were gathered for our second synod of the ECC. And we, for those who are unfamiliar with the ECC, we have a, a tripartite governance. So we have uh, the executive branch, which is the, uh, which was the, what we now call the Episcopal Council. Back then it was only Bishop Peter who was the presiding bishop. And then we have two other houses. We have the House of Pastors, which is akin to the Senate in our, in our own federal um, government. And then we have the House of Laity, which is akin to the House of Representatives. And that's how, our, that's how we have our governance in the ECC. And so we broke into to our houses, the House of Laity, of which at that time I was part, and then the House of, of Pastors. And the very first canon that we were going to ratify, so we were gathered, we had, a constitution had been written, and now we were going to start going through the constitution and ratifying pieces of it. And those canons were simple, they're simple, they're just simply statements about what we believe, who we are as Catholic Christians in the world today. They're just simple statements of belief. You know, you hear things like canon law and all of that. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's simple statements of who we are. And the first statement of belief that we were going to ratify was about the bishop. And that the bishop is the center of our Eucharistic community. And that canon began with that the bishop is the shepherd of the, of the flock. And as we sat there, and I, again, I was only in one of the houses, but I heard about the other house. I can tell you, in our house, all hell broke loose. <laughs> and I, 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 I kid you not. There was such resistance to calling the bishop Peter Hickman, the shepherd of our flock. T Tony and were you? Was that the one you I missed? missed it? You missed that one, yeah. It's Tony and Mary. <laughs> Tony and Mary are, have been delegates since day one and, and still are. And, and, um, 
it was it was really quite rainless. Uh, and, and we had statements such as, we're not sheep. And, and I mean, it was, it was very, very difficult. And ultimately, both houses, the House of Pastors and the House of Laity, both determined that the, that the description of the bishop as shepherd should be removed from that canon. And it ultimately was. Now, it has since so we've worked it back in. So, so all is not lost. But as I'm now, you know, six years later, as I reflect back on those events, I can understand it. For you see, the people that were gathered there, most of them have, have come out of other, obviously the ECC was new, so they've come out of other faith traditions, most of them Roman Catholic, but not all. And I would say for every person there that voted for removing Shepherd from that canon had had some sort of really beautiful experience with a shepherd within the church. They had been hurt, in some cases deeply hurt. And for, you know, you can imagine all the various reasons. It could be because they, of divorce and remarriage and not being able to take part in the sacraments anymore. There was a deep hurt. Or for ordained, for ordained priests who, who fell in love and now no longer could, could exercise their priestly ministry. Um, and again, you can, you can, for every face in that room, you can come up with a different reason for that hurt. But that hurt was deep and it was real. And if we reflect back on the history of the church, that is our history. It begins as early as with the Apostle Peter, the one who Jesus commissions on the beach along the Sea of Tiberias. Within less than two decades, he is confronted by the Apostle Paul for being a hypocrite because he would not eat with the Gentile Christians when the, when the Christians from Jerusalem were there. And Paul, and I'm again paraphrasing, Paul says, I had to get in his face and tell him he was a hypocrite. So we have our shepherds within the church showing their humanity, going all the way back to the very first one, to, to, to the Apostle Peter. And then certainly as we look through church history, the hurts, the pain that has been caused by the church hierarchy is no stranger to any of us. You know, a simple reading of church history, we read about the corruption. Well, that corruption isn't, doesn't occur, you know, we had three popes at, at one time in the church. Well, that, did, that wasn't because of the faithful people that are sitting in the pews every Sunday, coming to Mass faithfully, getting on their knees every night and saying the rosary. Those aren't the people who failed. No, it's the leadership. It's the shepherds in the church who have failed over and over and caused harm to the body of Christ. So I'm not surprised when I reflect back and I look at that. You know, I've been here at St. Matthew for 23 years now. And I can tell you this, if, you're, if you haven't been around here for long, that if you're around here long enough, that a person in a collar will at some point either offend you or hurt you or disappoint you. It's going to happen. Bishop Peter is not perfect. I am not perfect. I know. Not perfect. <laughs> 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 I said eight o'clock at mass. No amens. What's it saying? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and most recently within our within within the broader church, we've seen, you know, we've seen this abuse scandal that has taken place. And, and as we look at that, it's not just the abuse that horrifies us, which it does, and, and rightfully so, but, but just as much the, the fact that there's been cover-ups and there's been the lack of, of, of wanting to even deal with it by, by the shepherds in the church, that we look at that and it's, it causes us great pain and, 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 and we have to recognize the humanity of those who are in leadership in the church. I can, I can tell you, and he doesn't know I'm going to say this because I didn't say this at the 8 o'clock mass. Our shepherd, I know his heart because I've known him for many, many years. And I know how much it is his heart that each of you grows in your relationship with the good shepherd. That is 
That is his one great desire. We do follow the good shepherd. And we have to remember that there is only one shepherd. Those of us who, who are in church leadership, we will fail you at some point. The good shepherd will never fail you. There is only one shepherd who had the power to lay down his life. There is only one shepherd who, has the, who had the power and did take up his life. There was only one shepherd who had the power to stretch out his arms and allow those nails to be driven through his flesh into that wood of the cross and to have his feet pierced by nails. There was only one shepherd who has the power to, to give each of us eternal life and that life springs to us first through our baptism and through our confirmation and this morning that very life will be imparted to us as we gather around the table and we share in the Eucharistic meal. That is the good shepherd that we serve and we must always remember that we have only one shepherd. He shall lead his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather his lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. That is the good news of the gospel. Amen. Amen.